Greetings guys, welcome back to my channel. I uh, just wanted to do a quick video today, as quick as and brief as I possibly can. Uh, concerning some recent events that I was able to witness last week on the Knights of God YouTube channel where there was a panel discussion between some Trinitarians and modalists. Um, they were discussing uh, things uh, about whether or not the Trinity was true or whether we should understand the nature of God through modalism. That is, God interacts with human beings through various modes as he interacts with mankind. I wanted to listen to this particular discussion because particularly the modalists have been known in the past who are on this uh, panel uh, have been known to throw some Greek Greek grammar around, Greek syntax around to try and prove their points. And I wanted to see how they were going to try and um, finagle this so-called talent of theirs into their overall um, presentation of modalism and why modalism is a superior understanding of the Trinity and even the correct understanding um making even trinitarianism um the heretical position something that um could even possibly condemn one to hell for believing so as way things turned out what i was hoping to happen did happen about the 140 mark of the discussion it lasted about five minutes and when the subject of john 1 1 came up the modalists raised what is known as Caldwell's rule We'll get into that later. And they use Caldwell's rule, they think, as a weapon to bludgeon the Trinitarians to say that their interpretation of John 1 1, where it says um, that um, Theos ain't halagos, that the Theos there is definite and not qualitative. And they were using Caldwell's rule supposedly to prove this point. So before I go in any further, I want to let the discussion play out. Let the supposed uh, people who are well-versed in Greek try and prove their modalistic point using Colwell's rule on John 1.1. 1, 1. And then once they let this play out, we're going to actually examine the evidence that they offer as they wave it around on the camera. We're going to go back and actually read what it has to say and find out who is telling the truth. So I'm going to share the screen. I'm going to pull up YouTube. And we are going to join in the discussion about the 140 mark, uh, where the Colwell's rule gets going. It lasts about three, four, five minutes. And then once we get finished with that, we'll get started. So get ready. He says, and what John 1 1 says. Yeah. I, I still, I, I, the only way that you can come to the conclusion that the word of God, I'd rather keep it like it is in the Greek. The logos was this, uh, I don't want to go ahead and take my preconceived biases and say, okay, anachronistically, since it says that the word became flesh, I can arbitrarily now define what the logos is up here and say that that's the son of God or the eternal begotten son of God. I can't do that. John didn't say in the beginning was the son and the, uh, you know, and the word, I mean, the son was with God and the son, what, I mean, so on and so forth. And God was, God was the word. You can take that. I'll take, I will agree. With you. Uh, one quick uh, commentary here. Just notice that the particular modalist here, Walter, um, takes the position that the Logos became the Son at the Incarnation, which is not correct. Moving on. With you on that very last sentence, but you can't ignore the first two. And Walter, I mean, I know you know the Greek very well. I know that, and I know you know. <laughs> Don't even go there. I only took a few semesters of it. Um. <clears throat> I got to join in right here. Um, notice uh, what uh, Walter says here. Um, the guy who's fixing to throw around Greek says he only took a couple of semesters of it, but yet he's fixing to um, school and lecture everyone on the Greek language. So let's let this play out some more. Okay. <laughs> no, no, no. You made it. Hold on. One thing, one thing Desmond, I'll let you go. Uh, a while back, you did speak on on John one one C as the uh, 
uh, deity or what? Hold on, let me go. To you said the word God in John one one C was a noun, right? Yeah, it is a noun. But how can that be a noun when the Greek construction has the article attached to the um, what attached to the to the to the word? So. And then that will also violate John one one B too. So if no. if, it, if it, it, it's because what? of yeah, it, it's because of Caldwell's rule. Okay, Cal all right, guys. Here it is. Here's where they're going to use supposedly use Caldwell's rule for their point. Here we go. Caldwell's rule, which was a very accepted rule, you know, uh, even s several decades ago, and then you got these new. So look here on the screen, you see the other modalist, Jerry pulls out his personal copy of Wallace's Greek grammar beyond the basics and starts waving it around. Like um, the, 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 the idea, if you wave around your, uh, your Greek syntax, that makes you an expert on Greek. Um, you know, I could do the same thing too. I've got a copy. I'm going to wave it around and then I'm an expert on Greek. Is that how it works? Let's see what they say. Social Trinitarian that are going ahead and introducing their new rule. Okay. Now, notice what he says here. He's trying to assert that anyone after Colwell are quote unquote social Trinitarians making new rules, but yet here they are going to quote from Wallace's Greek grammar to try and prove their point based on Colwell. Here we go. Listen, that was a pre verbal predicate nominative. Okay. And it doesn't require the, uh, what is it, the uh, definite article. It has to have uh, an article. On God. It doesn't it require to, the definite article to. before God, okay? Because it's the first of the subject matter. It's like, I don't have to say, the God told me. I, I, all I have to say is, God told me, okay? But it's in the assumed, Greek, it's different, though, Walter. A pre verbal predicate nominative does not require a definite article. The problem That's that we have is that we have two nominatives in the, inside of the Greek, which end with an O-S ending. That's logos well, the and problem, theos. If, if that's true, if that argument is true, then it violates John 1-1-B one, one, because you can't be God and be with God. It can't be. So that's no, why because whole, I, that's why it doesn't violate my understanding of it because I say proston theon is not with, like you understand with, but related to. Let me okay. read. Oh, well, so it's a different thing altogether. Okay, so the other modalist Jerry is about to quote from Wallace, where uh, Wallace gives us the Colwell's rule quoted from um, uh, the article in the doctoral dissertation that he came up with. Here we go. Yeah, go over the videos that I went. Oh, no, yes. Understand it clear. Permit me to read. I understand it very clear, Walter. Uh, after, uh, after, uh, after, after Jerry's. <laughs> After Jerry's done, I'm going to go ahead and introduce some questions too. From I Robert love you, Crawford. Crawford. Okay. Let, let me read Crowell's rule. Let me tell now, you. Now, uh, Brother I Crawford, do. after I read this rule, you should never, ever uh, make that argument again. Oh, Jerry, this is the MLB. Now, now, you heard this, right? Once he reads the Colwell rule, he's going to supposedly destroy the idea that Theos in John 11c is qualitative, it has to be definite. Now, listen closely, and then we're going to go over it. Hey, y'all, so whatever yeah. Jerry says is it. No uh, more debate. No, but he's yeah. reading, he's no, reading no. from Col Greek, Colwell's. It's Greek grammar. You, no, you, you made a statement from the Greek grammar that wasn't true. But let, let are, me read Colwell's rule. By the way, are they Trinitarians or one? Yes, oh, one. yes. Definitely. I'm going to look it up. Which precede the verb usually lack the article. A predicate nominative which precedes the verb cannot be translated as an indefinite or a qualitative. Now, did you hear that? He emphasized cannot. That's going to become significant. We're going to talk about it here in a second. Noun solely because of the absence of the article. If the context suggests that the predicate is definite, it should be translated as a definite noun. Okay. So you, you see this, right? That they quote from Caldwell's rule and they supposedly say it, it um, applies here and then they do this. As though this is the, the badge. We are the Greek authorities here. 
Now, um, as far as who's on the panel, as far as who's uh, got, uh, as far as the Trinitarians go, who has the the, the more of a Greek expertise is uh, Brother Crawford, and he told them that he would go back and look it up and get back with them. So it didn't get discussed in, in the debate. Okay. I want to ask, is what they have said here, is it correct? Okay. They quoted from Wallace's grammar. They quoted Caldwell's rule. Now, we're going to stop sharing the YouTube video because there's no point in keep going any further. They've, they've, uh, they've made their insertion. They're asserting that Caldwell's rule means that preverbal and authoris predicate nominatives are definite, they're not qualitative, they're not indefinite. That's basically what's going on here because of the way Jerry emphasized it and then Walter's agreeing on it. They're claiming that Colwell was saying that all preverbal and arthrus predicate nominatives are definite, okay? So we're gonna stop the share and I'm gonna bring up a different share where I'm actually gonna bring up in Logos Ready for it? Wallace's Greek Grammar Beyond the Basics. Okay, this is the section that they're quoting from. This is page 256 if you want to look it up in your Logos or in your actual book. This is where Wallace discusses um, the Colwell's rule, Colwell's construction in detail. He gives a little bit of an introduction to it at the beginning of the book, page five through six, but this is where we go into in depth here. So. Everybody following along. We've used a lot of big words. Now, there are certain people out there who think that you can't go deep into the Greek because uh, you have to assume that your audience isn't capable of following it. Yet, when they want to use the Greek, they'll use the Greek. And they'll simplify it, water it down, and in the process, misrepresent what the Greek has to say. I have more faith in my audience than most other people do. I think that you are capable of following along with this because one of the keys to understanding Greek syntax is understanding English grammar and syntax first. So as we bring this stuff up, recall to your mind things you used to know, learn from high school English. If you've got an old English grammar, you can pull that down. You could even look it up on the internet. This isn't rocket science. We can do this, guys. So let's dig in here. What does Wallace say concerning Caldwell's rule? Now, these guys will say in this video, uh, if you keep on going, that they'll say it's the best grammar around. He's good stuff, even though he's post Caldwell. You can still trust Wallace. So here we go. Under anarthrous preverbal predicate nominatives, you have to know the terms. Anarthrous means simply a noun that lacks the article. Anarthrous. You have the, the alpha with the new in front which means, or it comes over with A and N in English. It's just the alpha privative lacking the article. Okay, preverbal means you have the uh, have a noun that comes before the verb and not what you would normally see after the verb, especially with predicate nominatives. Predicate nominatives is a noun that's in the nominative case, which is the same as the subject, more or less. Okay, so there's some sort of uh, relationship um, sometimes even equating going on, stuff like that. You should be familiar with at least a predicate nominative. So that's what um, this um, issue is. Um, basically, when we go through this, it'll be best to refer to, instead of Colwell's rule, Colwell's construction, because Colwell's rule has had to be modified based off of later and more accurate scholarship and pointing out errors in Caldwell's doctoral dissertation and article, okay? Um, basically, when you go through here, uh, you get a short history of how Caldwell came up with his rule. First off, in 1931, he did a doctorate on just the character of the Greek of John's gospel, and I want you to notice that. He zooms in only on John's gospel on the greek okay that led him to discover this colwell's rule and then he published it in an article in 1933 you can see that here as a reference it can be looked up okay 
this is the rule. And as far as it goes, they quoted it correctly, okay? Definite predicate nouns which precede the verb, now watch it, usually lack the article. Not always, usually. A predicate nominative which precedes the verb cannot be translated as an indefinite or qualitative solely because of the absence of the article, okay? So let, notice that. There's, there's not this absolute here in the, the stating of the rule. Usually likes the article, and you can't say it's indefinite or qualitative solely because of the absence of the article. That's all he was saying. If the context suggests that the predicate is definite, it should be translated as definite now. Context. The way he came up with this was in John 149. You can see it here in the grammar. You can see where this is where Nathaniel uh, was talking to Jesus. Uh, here we go. Apocrypha auto, Nathanael, Rabbi, su a ha quios to theu. Okay. Su basalus a to Israel. All right. You see what's going on here? You have your pronoun su. You have your verb a, and then you have an articular noun, ha quios, making it definite. Okay. Then you have the statement su basalus a to Israel. You have basalus drawn toward the front of the, the sentence and it lacks the article. So based on that observation, he noticed that within the context, he's talking about something definite and here you have the, the pre-verbal and arthritis predicate nominative. So that has to be definite. Okay. So that's what, Call, that's what got Caldwell started looking on that because he was looking at John 149. So in other words, he says that a predicate nominative that precedes the copula or the verb, and which is apparently definite from the context, usually lacks the article. Now, when you actually go and look at what he was saying in his dissertation, the context that he was looking at to determine definiteness was not the Greek itself. He was relying on an English translation and then going from an English translation to go into the Greek to see how the Greek behaved. It was very limited in focus. Now, as soon as Caldwell published this rule, nearly everybody all over the place were misunderstanding what he had to say because they seized on it because you could go to places like John 1-1 and pr absolutely prove, it was thought, the deity of Christ based off of this rule. But what they were going off of was not Caldwell's rule but the actual converse of the rule, which is what these modalists and the panel did, Jerry and Walter, that the converse, they were they're trying to say that all definite, um, all preverbal and arthritis predicate nominatives are definite, which is not what Caldwell said. Caldwell simply said that definite nouns that are preverbal and uh, uh, and arthritis, those, those definite, the preverbal um, nouns, those definite nouns, the ones that precede the verb, those are usually lacking the article. That's the only observation he made. Okay. Now, when he came up with this, that immediately threw some flags where people who were saying that you should be qualitative in John 1, 1, that became suspect because of the way people were understanding Colwell's rule. Like you have Moffat's The Translation Divine, you have other people also, um, it called into question the Jehovah's Witnesses New World Translation, where they translated it as a god. So that's one reason why uh, people seized on it. They wanted to, to go against uh, modalism. They wanted to go against Arianism, and they thought it gave them an advantage. But they were going off of the converse and making an assumption that all preverbal definite, preverbal and authorist nouns were definite. Okay. And eventually, even Caldwell himself tried to go beyond his own rule. He went on to say that he thought the converse, which we've been talking about, seemed to be valid as the rule itself. In fact, he stated that he felt like the rule suggested that an anarthrous preverbal predicate nominative would normally be definite. So he even thought that was the case. He just made the assertion. There was no scholarship behind it. He just was stating that's what he thought it would be. 
However, two important individuals came along later and did further research and pointed out very glaring errors in Colwell's work. It required it to be updated and clarified. First off was Harner, okay? He pointed out that Colwell was only researching predicate nouns or predicate nominatives that were either definite or indefinite. He didn't look at pre these um, anarthrous predicate nouns to see um, if there were any qualitatives. He was only drawn to that question of whether it's definite or indefinite. Didn't consider the qualitative question, okay? And probably the most, uh, the, the reason why he was drawn to that is many grammarians of that time didn't see the difference between that. They didn't really recognize the third category, but it did exist. Also, Horner came on and also, when he went in and went through the entire New Testament, he discovered that when you have these anarthrous preverbal predicate nominatives, that 80% of these Colwell constructions, as we should refer to them as, were actually qualitative. 20% actually involved definite nouns, which is completely way off from what Colwell was suggesting. Colwell was suggesting that it was normally the case, something on the is more often than not. As he went on in his life, he said it was uh, probably nearly always the case. When you actually go in and do the research, 80% of those constructions are actually qualitative. Colwell was wrong. Second guy, Dixon, came along. He pointed out that what was going on with this converse is an invalid inference. You cannot assume that every single preverbal and authorist predicate nominative is definite. In fact, when Dixon went on, he studied in John's gospel. He believed that most of the cases within John, he found out, were also qualitative in nature and not definite. So as you keep on going through the article here, the information that Wallace gives us, we're finding out what we were being told on the panel about Caldwell's rule and its application was simply incorrect. They're going off of bad information, and they're not even using the rule. They're using the converse of the rule, which by its nature is not valid. Here's one example of why the converse of Caldwell's rule is invalid. For example, if I were to say, if it's raining, there must be clouds in the sky. That's obvious. That's valid. That's true. But can you say the opposite? If there are clouds in the sky, it must be raining. You see what's going on here? You can't assume that always. You could have clouds in the sky and it's not raining. So simply to, to assert that the converse would have to be true without proof is invalid. And that's what these guys we're uh, bringing up. So when you actually pull together all the research that's been done since Caldwell, Wallace states that a general rule about a Caldwell construction can be stated now as an updated sta uh, status. An anarthrous preverbal predicate nominative is normally qualitative sometimes definite and only rarely an indefinite. Um, the two guys we just discussed, they didn't um, cite any indefinite predicate nominatives, but there may be some indefinite ones. And Wallace points out where there, there could be a few in the New Testament where that exists, but it's so rare. Um, you can't really appeal to an indefinite in this case. The burden of proof would rest upon the person who's making the case to try and prove it's indefinite when it's so rare and controversial. So that is a good discussion about what Colwell's rule was, what it's not, what the converse is, a discussion of is it valid and what does the evidence actually say concerning this issue. Now, when it comes down to John 1.1 and the issue of the predicate nominative, this same Greek grammarian that they were hailing as this great authority, waving it around, claiming this badge, 
of truth also goes on to tell us how we determine this issue of John 1 1. What's the subject? How do we interpret the theos in John 1 1? See, you can zoom in. This time you would go to page 40 of the Greek grammar in his syntax. He goes over again what is a predicate nominative, where you have the subject joined to another noun because of an equative verb. You can either have it actually in the text or it can be implied. That's one thing people miss a lot in Greek. Um, Greek doesn't have to say everything to make it so. The actual verb can be implied. There's different verbs that you can use um, when you are um, using these constructions. And we'll get into what John 1.1 1, 1 is. Most of the time you have a form of a me or genomai or even huparkom. But occasionally you will find some passives of transitive verbs. What's a transitive verb? Can you go back to high school English for a second? Transitive verbs are verbs that take direct objects. So when you have uh, the verbs kaleo and hurisko, when they are in the passive form, sometimes even those can have predicate nominatives. And you can see the examples of all sites here. So the issue in John 1 1 becomes um problematic because of the word order because english requires us to put the subject first we can't think in in, the, in those categories but uh greek uh grammar allowed for changing of word order for emphasis we don't really see that as much in english but with greek it's all over the place so we're going to get to how that all comes together okay within the predicate nominatives where you have the subject in an equative verb, sometimes you have those passive verbs we talked about. You can have two different categories. One, you could have the subset proposition, where you have one item being a member of a class of a larger group. And you can have what's also called the convertible proposition. Basically, if you go back to basic uh, rules, um, even in uh, geometry, things like that, in high school math, or actually not geometry, and algebra, basic formulas, A equals B, and therefore, and B equals A. It's back and forth. So they're up to be identical. So those are the two possibilities when you have these predicate nominative discussions, okay? convertible or subset that's the two you've got to consider moving on down in the grammar how do you determine the difference between a subject and a predicate nominative in corne greek okay we have what are called grammatical tags all right the tags there are three one can be the subject being the pronoun okay the pronoun can be explicit within the greek or it can be implied you have to remember that explicit or implied so you have a pronoun first tag or you could have the second tag the subject being articular meaning that the the subject in the nominative case contains the greek article some form of ha he or ta okay or the third one the subject will be a proper name those are the three tags all right so how do you determine from those three tags which one comes first when you look at it in the word order okay this is essential to understanding greek you have to get this when you look at all three the first one you should always give the priority will be your pronoun about the only exception to this is when you have interrogative pronouns which that's asking a question and that's to be expected based off of the meaning of an interrogative pronoun so pronouns come first, okay? Then you have articular nouns and proper names. And we actually look at the evidence, it's kind of equal. So it can go either way, either between the articular noun and a proper name. So the, the only way you can really tell them apart, usually, if, if there's something in the context showing otherwise, though, usually word order determines this. So pronouns go first, articles, proper names and word order governs the last two now that you've got that down 
you understand what Colwell's rule actually is. And when you go into John 1 1, you can tell exactly what's going on. Okay. Here you have halagas ein prostum theon. Okay. The subject of this first clause is halagas. The verb is ein prostum theon. Okay. Lagos is differentiated between itself and theon, ton theon. Okay. And most everybody agrees that a reference to ton theon or theos in John is the father. I'm not going to really dispute that. But then you have this part. Kai theos ain halagos. Okay. Here you have the equated verb again, ain. And then you have a preverbal and authorist predicate nominative Colwell construction. And then you have halagos. Okay. So what does the syntax of Greek require? The first thing we look for is a pronoun. Is there a pronoun in this clause? No. Is there an articular noun in this clause? Yes. Ha logos. Okay. Is there a proper a, a proper name in the clause? Remember? Proper name, we have to consider that. Now, some people say, oh, yes, there is. Proper name, theos, God. No. Theos in Greek encompasses a wide idea, okay? Theos by itself is a Greek word. We're not talking about the Hebrew concept of God. We're talking about theos and its entire semantic domain, okay? Theos can be plural, like the Greek gods. It could be... Um, referring to an indefinite because of not having the article. There's a ton of different things it can be, but theos is not a proper noun. Theos is simply a noun. So it's not a proper noun. So the only thing in the tag that actually follows the rules here is halagos, which means the subject is halagos. So because of English, we have to tr translate with the subject first. The word was theos okay that's the way that goes so what about this is it equative or subset wallace will give us some more information here let me look it up here All right. So here we go. We've got all those tags. Remember, we've got convertibles and equatives. Okay. In order for something to be convertible, and you can see this on in the in the grammar, we're running out of time. So we'll just try and put this together. If it's convertible, we have to have both tags going on you have to have one or the other if something is a subset you have to have one of the tags so in this case here in this clause you have the, ta the tag here being halagos therefore you have this being part of a subset of theos so logos is part of a larger category of what can be called theos, that is deity as a class. So when you consider something that is deity, part, just for the sake of this discussion here, part's really a bad word because um, it, it, it violates the, the rule, the, the trinity. But for the sake of our discussion, what could be considered as a class of theos is the word, which would be the sun, as we would later find out. So what we have here is an assertion that is, a, is about as concise as you can get that has never been rivaled by anybody since the time of John in the patristic sources, even down into our day. 
It's a statement that clearly denies what is called Sabellianism, the idea of modalism, that the, the word was the father. Remember, it would have to be equative or convertible here. You would have to be able to be saying that the father was the word, but that's not what's here. You have the one tag, so they have the subset proposition going on, where the word is part of the larger category of theos. So you can tell also, not only is it not Sabellianism, but it's also not Arianism, because logos is theos. And the only thing in the Hebrew worldview that is considered theos is Yahweh. It's really an open and shut case, and you can't push back on it. You can't abuse Caldwell's rule by setting its converse, and you also can't rely on the accuracy of Caldwell's rule as it was originally stated because he didn't completely do all of his homework. It was a case based off of limited observations and tried to blow up the case far beyond than he actually had evidence for. That's why in Greek grammar and Greek syntax, you always start by identifying all the constructions, and then you see how it's used. But that's not what Caldwell did. Caldwell saw something on the English side, sought to find evidence for it, and then based off of limited evidence, tried to assert something even beyond what he noticed in his dissertation. This is a very quick overview. It, it, it's um, a quick dive into English grammar and syntax. It requires critical thinking. But guys, what I've tried to, to show you here is that this is why I got involved in studying Greek. There are people out there who will take advantage of ignorance. And they will make assertions that are not true and will try and lead you away from the truth of the faith. And that's exactly what was going on in this panel. Now, there were other people, particularly in the chat, who I thought would be bringing up this, but I was the only one trying, just jumping up and, and down in the chat pointing out here, this is an abuse of Wallace's syntax. This is an abuse. If you're going to use Greek grammar and syntax, guys, you better be able to do more than quote from a quote sheet or going off of just learning basic first-year Greek. I'm serious. This is a huge problem, even among people who are educated ministers within the church itself, because even educated Trinitarian Christians have misused and still misuse Colwell's rule. And that's why I wanted to address this with you all and talk about these issues. I hope you guys are doing great. And I hope this video blesses you and gets you to think about larger issues. If you have questions, you can always email me, comment in the comment section, share this video, get other people talking about these issues, and let's be more informed about the issues so we can better defend the truth because God is not honored when we speak the truth in ways that do not represent the truth and even speak in ways that are not truthful on purpose to gain an audience, to gain a following, or even to make issues less complex so as to pull the wool over people's eyes and to give them a false sense of security. Hope you guys are blessed. Hope you enjoy it. Thanks, and I hope you have a wonderful day.